Book Thirteen, Part Two, of Ovid's Metamorphoses. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dennis Sayers. Metamorphoses by Publius Ovidius Naso. Translated by Brooks Moore. Book Thirteen, Part Two. If my desire and yours could have prevailed, O noble Greeks, the man who should receive a prize so valued would not be in doubt, and you would now enjoy your arms, and we enjoy you, great Achilles. Since unjust fate has denied him both to me and you, and here he wiped his eyes dry with his hands, as though then shedding tears. Who could succeed the great Achilles better than the one through whom the great Achilles joined the Greeks? Let Ajax win no votes, because he seems to be as stupid as the truth declares. Let not my talents, which were always used for service of the Greeks, increase my harm, and let this eloquence of mine, if such we call it, which is pleading now for me, as it has pleaded many times for you, awake no envy. Let each man show his best. Now, as for ancestors and noble birth and deeds we have not done ourselves, all these I hardly call them ours. But if he boasts, because he is the great-grandson of Jove, the founder of my family, you know, is Jupiter. By birth I am just the same degree removed from Jupiter as he. Laertes is my father, my grandsire is Arcesius, and my great-grandsire is Jove and my line has no banished criminal. My mother's grandsire, Mercury, would give me further claims of birth, on either side a god, but not because my mother's line is better, and not because my father certainly is innocent of his own brother's blood, have I advanced my claim to own those arms. Let personal merit weigh the cause alone. Let Ajax win no credit from the fact that Telamon was brother unto Peleus. Let not his merit be that he is near by blood. May honour of manhood weigh in your award. But if you seek the heir and next of kin, Peleus is father and Pyrrhus is the son of great Achilles. Where is Ajax, then? These arms might go to Pythia or to Skyros. Teucer might claim the prize, because he is Achilles' cousin. Does he seek these arms? And if he did, would you allow his claim? Since then the contest lies in deeds alone, though I have done more than may be well told, I will recall them as they have occurred. Achilles' narid mother, who foresaw his death, concealed her son by change of dress. By that disguise Ajax, among the rest, was well deceived. I showed, with women's wares, arms that might win the spirit of a man. The hero still wore clothing of a girl, when, as he held a shield and spear, I said, Son of a goddess, Pergama but waits to fall by you. Why do you hesitate to assure the overthrow of mighty Troy? With these bold words I laid my hand on him, and, too, brave actions I sent forth the brave. His deeds of bravery 
are therefore mine. It was my power that conquered Telephus, as he fought with his lance. It was through me that, vanquished and suppliant, he at last was healed. I caused the fall of Thebes. Believe me, I took Lesbos, Tenedos, Chrysa, and Scylla, and the cities of Apollo, and I took Skyros. Think, too, of the Lyrnesian wall, as shaken by my hand, destroyed and thrown down level with the ground. Let this suffice. I found the man who caused fierce Hector's death. Through me, the famous Hector now lies low, and for those arms which made Achilles known, I now demand these arms. To him, alive, I gave them. At his death, they should be mine. After the grief of one had reached all Greece, and ships a thousand filled Yobian Aulis, the breezes long expected would not blow or adverse held the helpless fleet ashore. Then ruthless oracles gave their command that Agamemnon should make sacrifice of his loved daughter, and so satisfy Diana's cruel heart. The father stood up resolute, enraged against the gods, apparent even though a king. I turned, by tactful words, a father's tender heart to the great issue of the public weal. I will confess it, and when I have confessed, may the son of Atreus pardon. I had to plead a difficult case before a partial judge. The people's good, his brother's, and stern duty that followed his great office, won his ear, till royal honour outweighed claims of blood. I sought the mother, who could not be won by pleading, but must be deceived by craft. Had Ajax gone to her, our thousand sails would still droop, waiting for the favouring breeze. As a bold envoy, I was even sent off to the towers of Ilium, and there I saw the Senate House of lofty Troy, and fearless entered it, while it was full of heroes. There, undaunted, I spoke for the cause which all the Greeks had given me. Accusing Paris, I demanded back the gold and stolen Helen, and I moved both Priam and Atenor. All the while Paris, his brothers, and their robber crew, could scarce withhold their wicked hands from me. And all this, Menelaus, is well known to you. That was the first danger I shared with you. I need not linger over the many things which, by my counsel and my bravery, I have accomplished through this long-drawn war. A long time, after the first battle-clash, the foe lay quiet within city walls, giving no challenge for an open fight. He stood nine years of siege, before we fought what were you doing all that tedious time? What use were you, good only in a fight? If you will make inquiry of my deeds, I fashioned ambuscades for enemies, and circled our defences with a trench. I cheered allies, so that they might all endure with patient minds a long protracted war. I showed how our own army might subsist, and how it could be armed, and I was sent wherever the necessity required. Then, at the wish of Jove, our king, Deceive by a false dream, bids us give up the war, he could excuse his order by the cause. Let Ajax tell him Troy must be laid low, or let him fight. At least he can do that. Why does he fail to stop the fugitives? Why not take arms, and tell the wavering crowd to rally round him? 
would that be too much for one who never speaks except to boast but now words fail me ajax turns and flees i witnessed it and was ashamed to see you turn disgraced preparing sails for flight with exclamations and without delay i said what are you doing oh my friends has madness seized you that you will quit troy which is as good as taken what can you bear home after ten years but your disgrace with these commanding words which grief itself gave eloquence i brought resisting greeks back from their purposed flight atrides called together his allies all terror struck even then ajax the son of telamon dared not vouchsafe one word but impudent thersites hurled vile words against the kings and thanks to me he did not miss reproof i rose and spoke to my disheartened friends reviving their lost courage with my words from that time forth whatever deeds this man my rival may have done belong to me twas i who stayed his flight and brought him back which of the noble greeks has given you praise or sought your company yet diomed has shared his deeds with me and praises me and while ulysses is with him is brave and confident tis worthy of regard when out of many thousands of the greeks a man becomes the choice of diomed it was not lot that ordered me to go and yet despising dangers of the night despising dangers of the enemy i slew one dolon of the phrygian race who dared to do the very things we dared but not before i had prevailed on him to tell me everything by which i learned perfidious actions which troy had designed of such things now i had discovered all that should be found out and i might have then returned to enjoy the praise i had deserved but not content with that i sought the tent of rhesus and within his camp i slew him and his proved attendants having thus gained as a conqueror my own desires i drove back in a captured chariot a joyous triumph well deny me then the arms of him whose steeds the enemy demanded as the price of one night's aid ajax himself has been more generous why should i name sarpedon's lycian troops among whom i made havoc with my sword i left coeranos dead and streaming blood with the sword i killed alaster chromius alcander pritanus helius noemon thon and charo with chersidemus and enomus all driven by cruel fate not reckoning humbler men whom i laid low battling beneath the shadows of the city walls and fellow citizens i have my wounds honourable in the front do not believe my word alone look for yourselves and see then with one hand he drew his robe aside here is a breast he cried that bled for you but ajax never shed a drop of blood to aid his friends in all these many years and has a body free of any wound what does it prove if he declares that he fought for our ships against both troy and jove i grant he did for it is not my want with malice to belittle another's deeds but let him not claim for himself alone an honour in which all may have a share let him concede some credit due to you 
disguised within the fear-inspiring arms of great Achilles. Actor's son drove back the host of Trojans from our threatened fleet, or ships, and Ajax would have burned together. Unmindful of the king, the chiefs, and me, he dreams that he alone dared to engage in a single fight with Hector. He, the ninth to volunteer, and chosen just by lot. But yet, O oh brave chief, what availed the fight? Hector returned, not injured by a wound. Ah, bitter fate, with how much grief I am compelled to recollect the time when brave Achilles, bulwark of the Greeks, was slain. Nor tears nor grief nor fear could hinder me. I carried his dead body from the ground, uplifted on these shoulders, I repeat, upon these shoulders, from that ground I bore off dead Achilles, and those arms which now I want to bear away again. I have the strength to walk beneath their weight, I have a mind to understand their worth. Did the hero's mother goddess of the sea when for her son these arms made by a god a work of wondrous art to have them clothe a rude soldier which has no mind at all he never could be made to understand the rich engravings pictured on the shield the ocean earth and stars in lofty skies the pleiades and hyades the bear which touches not the ocean, far beyond the varied planets, and the fire-bright sword of high Orion. He demands a prize, which, if he had it, would be lost on him. What of his taunting me, because I shrank from hardships of this war, and I was slow to join the expedition? Does he not see that he reviles the great Achilles, too, was my pretense a crime? Then so was his. Was our delay a fault? Mine was the less, for I came sooner. Me, a loving wife detained from war, a loving mother, him. Some hours we gave to them, the rest to you. Why should I be alarmed, if now I am unable to defend myself against this accusation, which is just the same as you have brought against so great a man. Yet he was found by the dexterity of me, Ulysses, and Ulysses was not found by the dexterity of Ajax. It is no wonder that he pours on me reproaches of his silly tongue, because he charges you with what is worthy shame. Am I depraved, because this Palamedes has improperly been charged with crime by me? Then was it honourable for all of you, if you condemned him? Only think that he, the son of Napleus, made no defence against the crime, so great, so manifest. Nor did you only hear the charges brought against him, but you saw the proof yourself, and in the gold his villainy was shown. Nor am I to be blamed if Vulcan's Isle of Limnus has become the residence of Philoctetes. Greeks, defend yourselves, for you agreed to it. Yes, I admit I urged him to withdraw from toils of war and those of travel, and attempt by rest to ease his cruel pain. He took my advice, and lives. The advice was not alone well meant, that would have been enough, but it was wise, because our prophets have declared he must lead us, if we may still maintain our hope for Troy's destruction. Therefore you must not entrust that work to me. Much better send the son of Telamon, his eloquence will overcome the hero's rage, most fierce from his disease and anger, or else his invention of some wile 
will skilfully deliver him to us. The Samoys will first flow backward, Ida stand without its foliage, and Achaea promise aid to Troy itself. Ere, lacking aid from me, the craft of stupid Ajax will avail. Though, Philoctetes, you should be enraged against your friends, against the king and me, although you curse and everlastingly devote my head to harm, although you wish to ease your anguish, that I may be given into your power, that you may shed my blood, and though you wait your turn and chance at me, still I will undertake the quest, and will try all my skill to bring you back with me. If my good fortune then will favour me, I shall obtain your arrows, as I made the Trojan seer my captive, as I learned the heavenly oracles and fate of Troy, and as I brought back through a host of foes Minerva's image from the citadel. And is it possible Ajax may now compare himself with me? Truly, the fates will hold Troy from our capture if we leave the statue. Where is valiant Ajax now? Where are the boasts of that tremendous man? Why are you trembling, while Ulysses dares to go beyond our guards and brave the night? In spite of hostile swords, he goes within not only the strong walls of Troy, but even the citadel, lifts up the goddess from her shrine, and takes her through the enemy. If I had not done this, Telamon's son would bear his shield of seven bull hides in vain. That night I gained the victory over Troy. T'was then I won our war with Pergama, because I made it possible to win. Stop hinting by your look and muttered words that Diomed was my partner in the deed. The praise he won is his. You certainly fought not alone when you held up your shield to save the allied fleet. A multitude was with you, but a single man gave me his valued help. And if he did not know a fighting man, cannot gain victory so surely as the wise man, that the victory is given to something rarer than a brave right hand. He would himself be a contender now, for these illustrious arms. Ajax, the less, would have come forward too. So would the fierce Eurypylus, so would Andreamon's son. Nor would Idomeneus withhold his claim, nor would his countryman, Meriones. Yes, Menelaus too would seek the prize. All these brave men, my equals in the field, have yielded to my wisdom. Your right hand is valuable in war. Your temper stands in need of my direction. You have strength without intelligence. I look out for the future. You are able in the fight. I help our king to find the proper time. Your body may give service, and my mind must point the way. And just as much as he who guides the ship must be superior to him who rows it, and we all agree the general is greater than the soldier, so do I excel you. In the body lives an intellect much rarer than a hand. By that we measure human excellence. O chieftains, recompense my vigilance, for all these years of anxious care, award this honour to my many services, our victory is in sight. I have removed the opposing fates, and opening wide the way to capture Pergama, have captured it. Now, by our common hopes, by Troy's high walls already tottering and about to fall, and by the gods that I won from the foe, by what remains for wisdom to devise, or what may call for bold and fearless deeds, if you think any hope is left for Troy, remember me. Or, if you do not give these arms to me, then give them all to her. And he pointed to Minerva's fateful head. 
the assembled body of the chiefs was moved, and then appeared the power of eloquence. The fluent man received, amid applause, the arms of the brave man. His rival, who so often, when alone, stood firm against great Hector and the sword, and flames, and Jove, stood not against a single passion, wrath. The unconquerable was conquered, by his grief. He drew his sword and said, This is at least my own. Or will Ulysses also claim this for himself? I must use this against myself, the blade which often has been wet, dripping with blood of Phrygians I have slain, will drip with his own master's blood, lest any man but Ajax vanquish Ajax, saying this, he turned toward the vital spot in his own breast, which never had felt a wound, the fated sword, and plunged it deeply in. Though many sought to aid, no hand had strength to draw that steel, deep driven. The blood itself, unaided, drove it out. The ensanguined earth, sprouted from her green turf that purple flower which grew of old from hyacinthine blood its petals now are charged with double freight the warrior's name apollo's cry of woe end of book thirteen part two read by dennis sayers in modesto california for librivox